welcome to the NTEB Radio Bible Study with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible, this program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good evening, everybody. Happy Wednesday, and welcome to this edition of Rightly Dividing. My name is Jeff Greider. I am the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight, for the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight's topic, on the front lines of the end times, you need to put on the whole armor of God to engage in spiritual warfare. Listen to any of our programs for any length of time, and odds are you will hear us reminding you that the war is real, the battle is hot, and the time is short, and calling you to the fight. That fight is not with the government, any government, and it's not waged using knives and guns and bats and brass knuckles. No, sir. If you're born again, If you're a born-again Christian who is storming the capital, you have the wrong fight. Our fight is against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Our fight is a spiritual fight. Now, let's put on some armor. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. On this episode of Rightly Dividing, our Apostle Paul calls us soldiers. He tells us that we have weapons, and he calls us to the fight that every blood-bought Christian is obligated to join in on some level. Neutrality will not be recognized by the Lord or the devil. If you believe your King James Bible, then you understand that we, the body and bride of King Jesus, we return with him on supernatural white horses in Revelation 19 to fight the battle of Armageddon. That's a literal battle. Right now, we are called to fight a spiritual battle, and on this episode of Rightly Dividing, we take you through basic training for warfare. On the front lines of the end times, if you've always wanted to know all about the whole armor of God, you're not going to want to miss this broadcast, and we're very, very glad that you're here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for all these that you've gathered here, and we thank you, Lord, for all the people that will be listening in the archives later tonight, tomorrow, and during the week. And we pray, Lord, for a fresh unction of the Holy Spirit today. We are sealed until the day of redemption. And we pray, Father God, that you would meet with us now and and give us a fresh blessing, Lord, from your word, from your spirit. And uh, Lord, the war is real, the battle is hot, and the time is almost up. And uh, we are here in the front lines. Give us something tonight that will help us, Lord. And if there be one listening who is lost, who doesn't know you as Savior and full pardon and forgiveness of their own sins, then we pray that something would be said and done tonight, Lord, to lead a lost soul to you. And we pray for those of us that are saved, that something would be said and done to get us back on fire and back in the fight. And we ask all these things, Lord. Um, In Jesus' name, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Glad that you're here tonight. A very emotional day for me today. One of my um, very, very good friends is fighting for her life in a hospital bed in New Jersey right now. Uh, She had a massive stroke this morning. She actually had the stroke when she was on the phone with me. And uh, scary, scary thing. Her name is Annetta. And uh, she's been on the prayer list for quite some time, and she's going to stay on the prayer list. Um, She is in a medical coma right now. The doctors say that fortunately the bleeding appears to have not been in a part of the brain that controls speech, and we're going to see what happens when they wake her up out of the coma in about five to seven days. But uh, if you could pray for my friend, 
my dear friend Annetta, and uh, she needs to get saved, and she needs to get out of that hospital bed. And uh, Well, we're going to pray for a bunch of things at the bottom of the hour, but that's what I've been dealing with today, and a very emotional day for me today, as you might well imagine. And um, I had a whole different Bible study planned. I'd, <clears throat> I had been studying all week in, in Psalm 78 and 79, and I had some really, really interesting, fun things picked out prophetically, and we were going to look at all that, and then today everything changed, and just the events of today reinforced in my mind the spiritual battle that we are all in. If you're saved, there's no being neutral. If you're saved today, you are in a spiritual battle. And we're going to look at that from the Bible tonight. We're going to see how Paul says that we are soldiers. And we're going to see what the weapons of our warfare really are. And as I um, thought about my friend Annetta today and, and everything that she's been going through and um, how scary it is to, to have that happen and, and, and what, she, what must have been going through her mind when she realized that something was very, very wrong and she easily could have not made it this morning, very easily. But um, as soon as I realized what was happening and they took her off in the ambulance, I started burning up the phone lines and um, sending messages to various prayer warriors that I know. And they spread the word to other people and I posted something on Facebook and it just really, as all this was unfolding, it just really showed me that we're in a spiritual battle. And so tonight I thought it would be a good thing. I forget who it was, forgive me, but somebody a couple of weeks ago was asking, can we have a Bible study on Ephesians chapter 6? Well, tonight's the night, and... um I'm glad that you're here, and I hope that you've come for a blessing, and uh, we are going to storm the gates of heaven tonight, and we are going to look at what the Apostle Paul says that all of us, the commission that we've been given, you know, when you join the military, my dad um, volunteered for World War II, and he, um, he became a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Air Force. And when you join the military, you get a commission. The Apostle Paul had a commission. We're going to look at that. The Apostle Paul gives Timothy a charge and a commission in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And tonight we're going to look at what it means to be a Christian soldier. And we know that we're living on the front lines of the end times. Today is day 786 of 15 days to flatten the curve. And if you don't, if, if you don't think that things are bad now, <laughs> man, and they're only going to get worse. So today we're going to look at what it means to be a Christian soldier and to fight the good fight of faith as defined by the King James Bible. Very, very glad that you're here tonight. The preachers are weary, the singers are tired, the church as we know it is losing its fire and some are discouraged from bearing the load but we must determine to keep pressing on cause it's just one more soul were to walk down the aisle it would be worth every struggle it would be worth it Reach. 
kitchen And singers go sing And laymen keep sharing That Jesus is King The angels have gathered They're surrounding the throne And they'll start rejoicing For just one more soul Cause it's just one more soul A lot of people say that the music that we play here on this program is a blessing, and um, I try to play the type of music that appeals to me. I like the old-fashioned stuff. I I like the old-fashioned songs. I like songs that lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and one of the places that I get song ideas from, Marie Comfort over there on the west coast of Florida in Tampa, She's always sending me links to songs on YouTube, and I probably have about a dozen songs in our NTEB jukebox um, sent to me by Marie, and I very much appreciate um, uh, uh, how much she cares for this ministry and how much she prays for everybody. Marie Comfort is 84 years old, and and uh, she is on fire. She is headed for heaven, and she's waiting every day for the rapture. She's trying to get something done for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, she sends me some great song suggestions. That last one that I just played came from her, and so does this one. Place in my memory that you wash 
washed my sins away And for your precious Holy Spirit That I feel down in my soul And that's worth more to me Than every other Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. For peace and contentment in a world so filled with strife. Lord, thank you for the roses you place in my life. You place in my life. If you're just tuning in, tonight's topic on our Bible study tonight is spiritual warfare. A number of you, one person in particular, um, recently suggested this would be a really good topic. And if you were listening when we started the broadcast tonight, um, events that took place today reminded me 
to a very, very high degree that we are in a spiritual battle and we are called to the front lines of the end times. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. Look up Hebrews 10.34. You'll know who wrote the book of Hebrews. For, uh, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Tonight we're going to be looking at spiritual warfare. Not according to some YouTube preacher who wants to get you all riled up with feelings and emotions. We're going to look at spiritual warfare as defined by the Apostle Paul, and we're going to rightly divide it. We're going to spend the vast bulk of our time right here in Ephesians chapter 6, and we got about a couple of dozen, maybe a hundred cross-references that we got to get to tonight. And um, pray for me tonight that I'll be able to communicate effectively and, uh, as Paul says, boldly as I ought to. And um, time is short, people. Time is very, very, very short. And uh, we need to get charged up. We need to get going. And tonight we're going to look at what it means to be on the front lines of the end times as a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Glad you're here with us. If you have a prayer request, please post it in the chat room. Or if you have a praise report, post that too. Uh, And at the bottom of the hour, we're going to go over the chat room um, prayer requests and praise reports. Uh, Every Sunday morning, we go over the hall list, but that takes about 40 minutes, and we don't have time to do that during a Bible study. But um, if you want to post a prayer request, just go to ntebradio.com. That's the chat room. And... um, Post it and we'll pray for it. Glad you're here. Today 
Death Star, swelling river, like a warrior I shall come. Then I mean to shout salvation and go singing glory home. I'm a soldier bound for glory. I'm a soldier. sent the Savior to this world of sin and woe. It was love that left heaven's portals and came down to dwell below. It was love that stilled the water on the stormy Galilee. And it was love that paid sin's ransom one dark day on Calvary. Love so sublime, love so divine, love that is deeper than any sea. Love for us all, oh, how can it be? It is love that still is knocking at the hearts of sinful men. It is love that never tires, but that knocks and knocks again. It is love that solves all problems in this world of sin and strife. But it is love, the love of Jesus, that brings hope and peace and life. Love so sublime, love so divine, love that is deeper than any sea, love for us all, oh, how can it be? Now, I'm saved. Maybe. Say, I said me. I'm a saved man. He said, how do you know you're saved? I'm covered. I'm covered. You got any coverage? That's trouble with folks. Thinking this is going to save them, not going to save them. You ever get saved, you're going to be saved right there. You're going to go to hell like a bullet. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. 1 John 4.10 says, Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but <laughs> that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the substitute for our sins. First John 4.19, we love him because he first 
loved us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Father God, for just how you watch over us and you keep us safe and you lead us and guide us every step of the way. We're just truly grateful. Thank you for putting food on the table today. Thank you for putting clothes on our back and a roof over our head. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father God. Lord, tonight we pray for John Henry. He's having a heart catheter tomorrow, Thursday. Sounds like uh, he's at home. They're going to send a nurse to check on him. Uh, Please pray that this catheter will show what's happening to his heart and blood pressure. Dennis Giacomino is going through a treatment for prostate cancer. Please keep him in your prayers. Ron Wooter says, My sister-in-law's brother Joe is in ICU in a coma with pneumonia in one lung. Please pray that the Lord will touch him and guide the family in a potentially difficult decision in the next few days. Angel prayer request. Wade recovering from an illness two shots later. Needs our prayers. Stan, my recycle man, needs prayer. He has surgery on Friday for a groin hernia and will be recovering for a month. Both men are in their 70s. Um, Karen says, Good evening, church family. So tired trying to get ready for my trip to the camp meeting heading out Friday morning. Please pray for traveling mercies. Amen. And we're looking forward to seeing you. Jeanette has a praise report. I think I have found both the weekend. I think I have both the weekend caregiver spots filled now. Praise God. And she's very glad and grateful to get um, the missing piece to her caregiver puzzle. And what a blessing that is. And it gives her daughter a break. And please keep her daughter in your prayers as well. Jan Lacker, please pray for our protection as bad weather, severe winds and tornado warnings in the Twin Cities. Uh, Terry Bryant says, My twin told me that she was sick of my Bible babble and now refuses to speak to me on top of accusing me of things I have not done. Please remember Sherry in your prayers. She is in need of salvation. Amen. Shannon says, Please pray for me, meaning me, Boldness and strength, unwavering truth to be taught. Prayers for a sweet spirit in the chat room. Always want to pray for that. And please pray for the NTEB ministry team. Amen. Thank you. Aunt Nancy, prayer request at my lunch tomorrow with an estranged family member who grew up under the Roman Catholic Church will go well. I am praying the Lord will place his words on my tongue and her heart and mine and be found accepting to his glory and our good. Um, Gary, please pray for my youngest daughter as she has has been battling depression. Janet says, please pray for me. I am under spiritual attack. Uh, pray God protects my job and my family as I have been weary and discouraged. I am thankful for all God has done in my life and thank you for this church family. Amen. B says, praise report after six weeks. The x-rays show that my two technical fractures are healed and that my rotator cuff has a good range of motion, so I am cleared for physical therapy. Amen. Heath, please pray for me. I've been dizzy and lightheaded. If I can't work, I don't survive. Angel, prayers for Jan and her household that no weapon formed against her family um, and that the storm will pass. Vilma, Please pray for my unsaved children, family, and my cousin, Vicky. She's at the hospital with an upper respiratory infection. Jeanette says, please keep Lois Fall's husband, Joe, in your prayers. He's had a stroke on Friday, and he has been in and out. Uh, He just wants to go home and be in heaven. Also, her three grown kids, David, Rachel, and Joe, who have muscular dystrophy, but... (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me, but David is very bad with it. We've prayed for him before. His grace says, please pray for my wife's pen pal over the last 40 years. She is dying from cancer. The good news is, is she saved. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Harold says, please pray for my two sons, James and Zachary, that they would receive the Lord Jesus um, as Savior, that God would send them born-again mature believers into their life to witness to them. And Harold says, uh, thank you for your prayers. And I think it was Harold that suggested the Ephesians chapter 6 Bible study, now that I'm thinking about it. Julia, please pray for my mother. She has a leaky heart valve. And Kat, please pray for some of my um, loved ones who are not saved. And of course, we're going to pray tonight for uh, my dear, dear friend, Anetta, who suffered a massive stroke while on the phone with me this morning while she was driving. And I'm going to talk about that tonight because it all has application to our Bible study. Um, please remember Anetta fighting for her life in a hospital bed right now. She's only 43 years old and um, suffered a massive stroke today in a brain bleed. Very scary stuff. Um, and let's pray that... Uh, the Lord would save her if she's not saved. I've been witnessing to her for a long time, and I don't know if she's saved or not, but whenever you're not sure, it's always better to pray for somebody's salvation if you're not 100% sure. Um, and we're going to pray for her to get saved, and we're going to pray for God to give her a complete and total healing. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for all these that you've gathered here. We thank you, Lord, for this chat room, and we thank you for the NTEB family, God, of Bible believers across America and around the world in over 130 different countries. And we're glad and we're grateful tonight, Lord. And for everybody that needs a healing, strokes and heart attacks and brain bleeds and cancer and COVID and infections and viruses and bacteria, just about everything that you can name, all the way to suicidal thoughts and depression. Lord, help us tonight. We need your help. We need a touch from the Master tonight, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you. We ask you, Lord, to just grab a hold of our hearts tonight again, Lord, and, and refocus our attention on you. We need you, Lord, more than we ever did. We need your book, Lord, more than we ever have. And we come before you, Lord, as a needy people. We need you, Father God. We don't we we want you, yes, but we confess our need, and happily so. Your word says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And we literally just throw ourselves at your feet tonight, Lord, and say, Do something with us and do something for us, and we'll give you all the honor and the glory and the praise and the thanksgiving for it. And now we ask you to meet with us now, Lord, and please help my friend Anetta, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, we have a lot to talk about tonight. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, and if I could ask uh, to keep the chat in the chat room to a minimum tonight, I have a really, really important Bible study. I'm not going to be looking too much at the chat room Um if there's any questions, Lori can grab that question for me and, and she can post it in the messenger box. But, but I'm not really going to be looking a whole lot in the chat room tonight because I really need to focus. And I really have a very, very important Bible study to bring you guys. And it's going to be, if, if you've heard a lot of messages about Ephesians chapter 6, and I have, over the years, and it's a very, very, um, every Christian should be intimately familiar with all of Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to go over some stuff tonight. But before we do, I want to tell you a little story, and if I could just have your attention, I want to tell you what happened to me this morning with my friend Anetta. And the reason why that I want to share this story with you is because you may find yourself in this position one day. You may find yourself in the position that I found myself in this morning. And things are going to happen so fast and so quickly 
You're not going to have time to think in the moment. And if you haven't prepared for this moment, the moment's going to pass you by and you're going to have regrets. We are called to be a soldier. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, this is what the Apostle Paul says about if you're born again, I don't care if you're a man, a woman, if you're young, if you're old, if you're middle-aged, if you're a child, I don't care if you're black or white, it doesn't matter. If you're a born-again child of God, according to John 3.3 3 and 3.5, and you've believed the gospel of the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, then I'm talking to you. 2 Timothy 2, 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Paul is not simply using a metaphor or a simile. Revelation 19.14, we are going to be on white horses as soldiers, as the army of the living God charging into the battle of Armageddon. And right here and right now, we are called to be soldiers in a spiritual battle. And I want to share with you what happened to me this morning. Because one day it may happen to you. And I want you to be ready if and when it does. We've been praying for my friend Annetta for quite some time. She has had some health challenges. We've been praying for her kidneys and her blood pressure. And we've been praying for her salvation. And not only is she a good friend of mine, but she is a co-worker of mine. And she lives up in New Jersey. And she works at the company that is a client to my company, Mudflower Design. So her and I are not just good friends, we are co-workers together. And so, once or twice a week as she's driving to work, she'll call me in the morning and we'll talk about work stuff. We'll talk about her kids, my kids, just life in general as friends will talk. But this morning, it was a very different type of phone call. And she called me up, and um, she's driving to work. She's about five minutes away from where she had to be. And we're talking for a couple of minutes, then all of a sudden, her side of the phone goes silent. And she's not responding. I can hear the car driving. But she's not responding. She's not saying anything. And after a couple of seconds, I said, did you hear what I said? Can you, can you still hear me? And she was quiet for another couple of moments. And she said in a very soft, low voice, she said, I don't feel right. She said, something feels wrong. And as she began to speak, trying to describe how she felt, I could, I could hear that it was harder and harder for her to form the words and to talk with me. And after about 30 seconds, it became obvious that she was having a stroke. She had all the classic signs, and she began to get very confused, and it was just the grace of God that enabled her to keep driving the car until she got to her boss's driveway. And as she was driving, and I'm praying to myself, God, don't let her crash. Don't let her stop by herself at the side of the road where I don't know where she is. 
She's in trouble. God help her. And then I, I started texting her boss and I said, she's going to be at your house in just about a minute or two. Call the ambulance, call the paramedics. She's having a stroke. And this is my actual phone conversation this morning. And then she, by the grace of God, she arrived where she was attempting to get to. The ambulance was on its way and I hung up the phone with her. She couldn't talk any longer. And then I put the phone down. And the very first thing that I did is I started contacting prayer warriors. And I said, pray now. This is the situation. Go. And after I had set that in motion, I dropped to my knees And the only thing that I could say, the only words that could come out of my mouth, I raised my, I bowed my head. I got on my knees. I raised my hands to heaven. And I just said, no. I said, Lord, don't let this happen. Save her. And from the depths of my soul, I just said, Lord, save. Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus. And that's all the words that I could get out of my mouth before tears started to flow. And later on, after she had gotten to the hospital and the doctors were working on her, I began to reflect. God knew that when she woke up this morning, she was going to have a massive stroke. The Lord knew that. I didn't know that. She didn't know that. But the Lord knew that. And I don't think it's any accident that he he made sure that she got on the phone with me, somebody who could tell who knew her very well, And who would know that she was having a stroke and that God would give me the ability to make the calls and send the text messages. And most important of all, that as this situation was going on, that people would begin to pray and to storm the throne room of God and intercede on her behalf. I didn't know that when I woke up this morning and she didn't know that when she woke up this morning, but God knew that. And the point of what I'm trying to tell you is today, God threw me in and said, here, I need you here on the front lines because something really bad is about to happen and she's going to need prayer and she's going to need prayer warriors. And so God put me in that position this morning. And I believe the doctor said that she got to the hospital just in time. And because of there was a very quick response, they think that they can minimize the damage. But the point of what I'm telling you is, you've got to be ready to be that prayer warrior for somebody else. And in cases like that, you don't know when that event is going to take place. You have no idea when God's going to suddenly tap you on the shoulder and say, it's game time, go. And if you haven't prayed up, you're going to fall flat on your face. If you haven't spent time in the word, you're going to fall flat on your face. You see, you and I are soldiers in a spiritual battle. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the captain of our soul. He's our commander in chief. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And this is why we are called to be soldiers. 
because there is a battle going on. And you need to be ready when the Lord at a moment's notice taps you on the shoulder and says it's game time. It's show time. And if you're not prayed up, if you're not in the word, you're going to crumble. You're going to fall apart. You're not going to know what to do. But that doesn't have to be you. You can be prepared and you can be ready. But you have to get into that mindset that we are soldiers. You know, when the Lord called me to start a street preaching team back in 2012, the very first person that he gave me was a Marine. The second person that he gave me was a Marine sniper. The third person that he gave me was a Coast Guard chaplain. The fourth person that he gave me uh, was uh, in the Air Force. Are you starting to see what I'm talking about? God gave me all military men. I was raised in a military family. I'm the son of a World War II veteran. When Paul says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has called him to be a soldier. Playtime is, it's been over for about 786 days. We are in the midst of an ongoing battle a spiritual battle on the front lines of the end times. And this, as you're going to see in our Bible study tonight in Ephesians chapter 6, this battle is not waged with knives and rocks and bats and sticks and guns and sharp pieces of broken glass and bits of metal. This battle that you and I have been called to, we wage this with prayer with a book, with a Savior, with a Holy Spirit. And you have got to be ready when the Lord taps you on the shoulder and says, I'm sending you in. And it was amazing for me this morning to watch God working in the midst of this unbelievably and rapidly unfolding situation and to see how God had set everything up. He put the right people in the place, um, in the right place at the right time. It was amazing watching the Lord work this morning. And I thank God that she called me today and not somebody else who maybe wouldn't be praying for her, maybe wouldn't be activating a prayer team to storm the gates of heaven. I don't know. I'm just really glad that she called me this morning and I'm really, really glad that the Lord used me as he used me. And when the Lord is getting ready to tap you on the shoulder and send you in, I want you to be ready as well. Tonight, we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare. Not from a theoretical, lofty, intellectual, pseudo-intellectual perspective. We're going to be talking about spiritual warfare All 52 cards on the table straight up. The ball being pitched over the plate waist high. We're going to put the cookies on the bottom shelf tonight so you can get them easily. And you'll have no excuse after tonight's Bible study for not being prepared for the fight that you and I are in. Now you might say to me, well, hey brother, if... If you've been called to fight some crazy fight, that's good for you, but I'm not fighting. God does not accept neutrality, and neither does the devil. You are on one side or the other. 
being neutral is you automatically put yourself on the losing side. Nobody is neutral in this fight. And the really fascinating thing for me about this Bible study is what you're going to learn tonight applies equally to everybody. Doesn't matter what you've been called to do. Doesn't matter what your spiritual gifts are. Doesn't matter what your station in life is. What we're going to see tonight with how to conduct spiritual warfare in the end times, this is going to apply across the board. If you're saved, what we're going to talk about is going to apply across the board equally. And I hope that it will be a blessing for you. If you're just tuning in tonight, we're going to talk about spiritual warfare in the end times. Glad you're here. Listen to me like you've never listened to me, ever in your life. We have got to lay our lives down for the purposes of God. This is not a Sunday school fifty, the Church of Jesus Christ. This is not an invitation to have continuous good times. This is a war for the souls of men. Come out from among them. Run for your life. Because this is about your life. It's not just about an opposing theology or conflicting viewpoint on Jesus. This is about your life. My mind is forever branded with the story that I heard of police officers from the city of New York as, as people were fleeing from a crumbling building. There were police officers and firemen and others that were running towards the building saying, run for your life at their own peril. And in some cases, I believe they knew they were going to die, but there was a sense of duty. I was crying out to God. I said, God, oh, Jesus, don't let my sense of duty be less for your kingdom than these beloved firemen and policemen were for those that are perishing in a falling tower. We're living in a generation when truth is falling into the streets. I want to be among those that are not running away from the conflict but running into the conflict and say, run for your life. Run from gospels that focus only on success and prosperity. Run. Run from those who use the name of Christ only for personal gain. Run from those that are picking your pocket in the name of Jesus. Run. Run from Gospels that only focus on self-improvement. Run! Run from churches where men and not Christ are glorified. Run! Run! Body of Christ, run! Get out! Don't touch the unclean thing. Run from churches in America and Canada where there is no Bible. There's no cross in the theology. There's no soul-searching word. There's no repentance from sin. There's no mention of the blood of Jesus. Run! It's unclean. Run! Run from churches where you're comfortable in your sins. If you come into the house of God and you've got sin in your life and you're not convicted of it, you're at a table of devils. Run from puppets that are filled with political men who are using the puppet of God for a personal political agenda. Run! Run from those who preach division between races and cultures. Run! Run! Get out! Turn it off! Get away from it! They know nothing of God. Run! from ungodly, spasmodic movements and endless, empty prophesying. Beloved church, run for your life. Run from preachers 
that stand and tell stories and jokes. Run like you've never run before. Run! 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 We are soldiers in a spiritual battle on the front lines of the end times. This is no game, this is no joke. These programs are not entertainment. And tonight we're going to open up the scriptures and see what real spiritual warfare is really all about. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, be with me as I preach and teach your word tonight, that um, if there be one listening who's not saved, that they'd get saved. And for those of us that are saved, uh, revive us again, Lord. Charge us up tonight uh, and prepare us for the battle. And we'll give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. The Apostle Paul mentions children, parents, servants, masters, just about everybody. Ephesians 6.1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers... Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So Ephesians chapter one, uh, 6, verses 1 through 9, laying the groundwork for how all of us, in a very general sense, should behave to each other in sight of doing it for the Lord. And one thing that the Apostle Paul is constantly reminding us of is that as we live our daily life, We are to do it with an eye towards our fellow man. Paul says that if... if If my eating meat causes my brother to stumble, he says, I will eat no meat while the world standeth. And the Apostle Paul said, I became all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And so the Apostle Paul was constantly looking out for his fellow man. Paul said, uh, looking upon the things of others more than your own things. But not just to do it from a humanist perspective. To be looking on the things of others and watching watching out for other people, especially your brothers and sisters in the Lord, and, and to do these things as unto the Lord. And that's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And then starting in verse 10, well, Paul's going to give us a charge. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, 
Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Stop right there. Paul spends the first nine verses reminding us that we should be looking out for our fellow man and we should be doing it as unto the Lord. And then Paul says, finally, my brethren, he's talking to believers. He's talking to saved, born again people. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul, when um, he came before the Lord and he had what he called a thorn in the flesh? And he went before the Lord three times to get that thing taken out. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So the first thing that I want to point out to you tonight, talking about spiritual warfare, you have to be strong in the Lord, not in yourself. And God intentionally allowed the Apostle Paul to live the rest of his life with that thorn in his flesh so that he would constantly be reminded that his strength came from the Lord and from the power of the Lord's might and not from anything that the Apostle Paul could say or do. So if you want to be a spiritual soldier and you want to fight this spiritual battle, before you ever even put the armor on yourself, you have to be strong in the Lord, not in yourself. And you have to be in the power of his might, not in the power of your might. That's condition number one. Condition number two, God has armor for us to put on. Ephesians 6, 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now I want to show you something that may be a little bit of a shock for you. Paul says in verse 12, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Keep your finger in Ephesians chapter 6 and Turn to John 21, Gospel of John 21. Uh, John 21, 18, Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. All right? Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Paul says in Ephesians 6, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Jesus told Peter, They're going to come for you, Peter, and they're going to strap you to a cross and they're going to kill you. 
And you're going to do that and give God the glory. Don't fight back against flesh and blood. But you're going to do this for the glory of God. In the pampered day and age that we live in, we can't imagine doing that for the glory of God. But that's what Peter was called to do. How about the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20? Verse 22, Acts 20:22. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. None of these things move me, Paul said. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Why? So that I might finish my course with joy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. So that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I'm going to give you one more. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And look down at the bottom of the chapter. And we'll see what Peter, James, and John did. Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to preach and teach Jesus Christ. Do you see what happened here in Acts chapter 5? Look at verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now go to, back to Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read the first couple words of verse 12 again. Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're not called to protest abortion centers. You're definitely not called to storm the Capitol on January 6th. You're not called to protest in the street against the government. Now, you have Christian liberty. You can do those things if you want to. But why would you want to? That's not our fight. Do you know why people abort babies? Mostly because they're not saved. And if it's a saved person, it's because they've gotten into a backslidden condition. Abortion is a sin like any other sin. It's not the unforgivable sin. If you've committed an abortion, put it under the blood. God forgives you if you're saved. But the point of what I'm saying is, we're not called to to storm the gates of the World Economic Forum and fight against Klaus Schwab. We're not called, whatever nation that you live in, we are not called to protest against the government. Can you think of any nation that exists right now that is more wicked than the nation of Rome? I can't think of any nation that exists right now that is more wicked than the nation of Rome. And yet none of the apostles spent five seconds protesting Caesar. And when the Roman soldiers came to get them, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here's the apostle Paul sitting in prison, waiting to be executed. And what does he tell Timothy? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered. 
What do you mean, Paul, ready to be offered? Don't you remember? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Oh, that's what you meant. He said, yeah, what do you think I meant? For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. When Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, do you see what every one of the apostles did? They did not wrestle against flesh and blood. In the Old Testament they did. But that was a different dispensation. We are in the age of salvation by grace through faith alone. Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. Paul says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's your fight. That's your battle. Now, if you want to go off and do stuff that you're not called to do and do stuff that you're not supposed to do, you want to go protest the government, have at it. You want to go protest abortion clinics, have at it. But that's not what you're called to do. 2 Timothy chapter 4 tells you what you're called to do. 2 Timothy 4.1 I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. That's what you're called to do. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what you're called to do. You're not called to protest the government. You're not called to storm the Capitol. You're not called to do any of that silly nonsense. Governments come and go. God sets them up and he takes them down and he sets them back up again. But if you're saved, you are called to fight against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This morning, when my friend Anetta was having a stroke, as soon as I was able to make sure that an ambulance was coming for her up in New Jersey, I instantly began to get people praying for her. And then I began to pray for her. That was the battle against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness that we can't see. Go read Job chapter 1 if you want to see what that spiritual battle looks like. And I got on my knees this morning and I cried out, No, God, don't let her die. Save her. That's the battle that we are called to do. All this other junk is a distraction to distract you into not doing what you were called to do. Paul says in Ephesians 6.13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. What is the evil day? Well, it could be a number of things. The evil day could be the day that Satan comes after you. The evil day could be the day that Satan comes after one of your loved ones. The evil day is the day where the the devil is attacking you. And we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. But our battle is a spiritual battle. We are spiritual soldiers. And Paul says, you better take the whole armor of God 
that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And what is that armor? Look at verse 14. Ephesians six fourteen. Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, the Bible says, Sanctify them, Lord, with thy word. Thy word is truth. John chapter 14, we talked about this on the last Bible study. John chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Paul says in verse 14 of Ephesians 6, Stand therefore, having your loins, that's your thighs and hip area. That's a place where you have a very large femoral artery. And if you're doing battle with, a, with, with the opposing soldier, and that soldier takes a shot at your leg, He's going after that femoral artery, so he slices you open and you bleed to death. And Paul says, you better get your loins girt about with truth. And you better have on that breastplate of righteousness. You ever look up that word righteousness? No, not talking about what does it mean in the Greek. Genesis 15:6 Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And all through the Bible God talks about righteousness. You know what salvation is? Salvation is that moment where Jesus gives you his righteousness in exchange for your sins. That's what salvation is. And Paul says, you need it. You got to have it. You got to have his righteousness, not your own righteousness. And that's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 6, having on the breastplate of righteousness. That's the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's an interesting one. And having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, the Bible says this about Jesus Christ. Did you know that the Lord has beautiful feet? He sure does. Romans 10.15 Romans 10.15 And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful of the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The Apostle Paul was quoting Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Ephesians 6, 14, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 say, For by grace are ye saved through faith, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not your faith that saves you. It's his faith. 
Bible has a very funny expression called the faith of him. Ephesians 3.12. Actually, Ephesians 3.11. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. It is his faith that gets you into the throne room. You got to have faith to believe in his faith. (laughs) But believe me when I tell you it's his faith that gets you home. It is his faith that keeps you saved and sealed. Not your faith. Your faith comes and goes. Your faith is not anywhere near as strong as his faith. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Are you starting to see how you prepare for the battle? It's not a battle to storm the Capitol. It's not a battle to protest the government. It's not a battle to take down Anthony Fauci or Bill Gates or Klaus Schwab. It's a battle against spiritual wickedness in high places. Remember, we live in a world we're only here for a very short time. And the whole trick to navigating this successfully is you got to get saved. And then after you get saved, we're called to be a witness for Jesus Christ to get other people saved. And in the meantime, Satan throws up a thousand and one distractions. Retirement packages, 401k. How are you going to live your sunset years? What type of retirement will you have? What college will will your children go to? All of these things are distractions. I'm not saying your kids should go to college. I'm saying that shouldn't be the main goal. We are in a spiritual battle. And you have to do things that will prepare you for what comes when this life is over, whenever that may be. And with that, we have to take our last break for the night. We'll be right back after this break. We have a lot more to talk about. Don't go anywhere.
in. We are back for the last half hour of tonight's Bible study. If you're just tuning in, we are talking about spiritual warfare. And uh, we're looking at some amazing things. You know, in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. That's exactly what I was saying in that other verse in Ephesians. It's not your faith. (laughs) Do you really think that your faith is strong enough to get you all the way through this life and all the way home to heaven? Not a chance. You and I, we are blown about. We are, one day we're hot, one day we're cold. One day we're on fire for God. The next day we're backslidden. You and I are up and down. But the Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus cried out, it is finished. Jesus says in the book of Revelation that he's the one that makes all things new in Revelation chapter 21. It's all about him, my friends. It's not about you. Revelation 21 verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ, it is his faith that saves you. It is his faith that preserves you. And it is his faith that seals you onto the day of redemption. And it's, look, you want a real easy theology lesson? It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. And you can waste your time talking about the Trinity and arguing about all this God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. And I'll make it real easy for you. It's all about Jesus Christ. If there's ever a doubt, if there's ever a hole in your theology, it's about Jesus Christ. Do you realize that Isaiah says this in Isaiah 9, 6? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name the name of Jesus, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice for henceforth even forever. Do you realize that Jesus says that in the volume of the book it is written of me? It's all about him. You don't have to. Yes, God exists in three, three parts. He can separate those parts at will. But Jesus has all the marbles. He's been given all the power. It's all about him. And it's all about his faith. And when you believe in him, he imputes his righteousness unto you. That's what the Bible calls justification. It is just as if you've never sinned. And we get his righteousness and his faith and his Holy Spirit. But that's a whole different Bible study. Back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Paul says this. Verse 16. 
above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the Bible. The Word of God, that's not a capital W. That's talking about the Bible. Verse 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now we're starting to see what the full armor, the whole armor of God actually is. It is, you've got to get into that book. You've got to have the right book. You've got to get into that book you got to know what that book says. And the only way that you can know what that book says, you got to read it for yourself every day. And one way that you can tell what level of spirituality you actually have, a lot of the times we can hear a really inspiring song We can watch a really fantastic Christian movie like Facing the Giants. And we think because we get inspired by that, that we have a high level of spirituality. And that's not necessarily the case. That's appealing to your feelings and your emotions. But the one of the most surefire ways that you can tell what your level of spirituality actually is, is your relationship to that book. Are you one of those people? You're going to read your three chapters per day, no matter how painful it is, no no matter how much you don't like doing it. (laughs) Are you the type of person that you open that book and you grit your teeth? And you just, okay, I did my three chapters for the day. Your relationship to that book is a direct indication of the actual level of spirituality that you possess. The more you love that book, the more you enjoy reading that book and learning what God has to teach you, that is one of the main indicators of what type of spirituality you actually have. It's not how much you know about the book. It's how much do you enjoy reading that book? Because that's where God talks to you. And if you're not one of those Christians that really enjoys reading the Bible, that's a problem. And that's a problem that you need to fix. Because if you're forcing yourself to read it, like you're taking some sort of a bitter medicine, because somebody told you if if you take this nasty medicine, it's going to make you feel better. And you're like, all right, I'll take it because I have to. That should not be your attitude about the Bible. You should open that book and say, Lord, I love your word. Show me something today. Take me on a little walk with you, God. And I sure would like it if you would reveal something new to me or give me light on something that you've already shown me. You know, the first time in your King James Bible where anybody gets raptured is Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, these are the beginnings of the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, and Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and he begat sons and daughters And all the days of Enoch, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, 
and he was not, for God took him. Wouldn't you like to be like Enoch, who is a type of a Christian getting raptured before the days of Noah? Wouldn't you like to be like Enoch? You spend your time walking with God, and one day God says, Hey, you've been walking with me so much that you're closer to my home than your home. Why don't you just keep walking with me? That's a very simplistic way to look at Genesis chapter 5, but that's basically what happened. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. You got to be walking with God if you want to be close to God. So the way that you feel about the Bible is a really good indication of the actual level of practical spirituality that you really possess. Not the type of show that you put on for people. Not what you want other people to think about you. But when you're by yourself first thing in the morning, you get your cup of tea, your cup of coffee, and you open up that book, do you look forward to it? Are you happy that God gave you another day? Are you thrilled to jump into the pages of Holy Scripture? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Bible. You got to love that book. And when you love that book, God is going to prepare you for the battle. When you pray, that's you talking to God. But when you read the Bible, that's God talking to you. And Paul says in verse 18 of Ephesians 6, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, the sword of the Spirit, righteousness, truth, faith, the Word of God, the helmet of salvation, and prayer. Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. (coughs) This morning, God called me in, very unexpectedly, and a huge prayer battle began. Prayer is the greatest weapon we have. And in order for you to be able to use that weapon effectively and properly, you have to be in the Word of God so that you know how to pray, so that you know what to pray, (laughs) and to know why it's important to be thankful And all these things, the only way that you find out about all these things is you've got to be in the Word and you've got to read the Word. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Do you realize what a weapon that book is? This is where spiritual warfare takes place. you got to dive into that word every chance that you get. you got to pray for your fellow brothers and sisters. And Paul says in verse 19, And for me, that all utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, 
that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Uh, Turn to Hebrews chapter 10, and I'll show you who wrote the book of Hebrews. It's not a mystery. I know just about every seminary in America, they have no idea who wrote the book of Hebrews. (laughs) But if you have a King James Bible, it's pretty clear. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul says in um, Ephesians chapter 6 that he is a ambassador for the gospel and he is in bonds. He's wearing chains. Hebrews 10.34, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews said this, For ye had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. When you put those verses together, you can see very clearly that the Apostle Paul, he was called by God to be an ambassador for the gospel, wearing the chains of a prisoner. And whoever wrote the book of Hebrews was an ambassador for the gospel who wore the chains of a prisoner. It doesn't take a seminary education to figure out that's the Apostle Paul. In fact a seminary education will likely keep you from coming to that revelation. So are you starting to see what true spiritual warfare actually is and how spiritual warfare is actually conducted? Let's review very, very quickly. These are the things that stand out in Ephesians chapter 6. You got to be strong in the Lord, number one, in the power of his might, number two. Paul says you got to put on the whole armor of God to fight the devil, that's number three. Paul says we're not fighting governments. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting spiritual wickedness. And Paul says that you've, you have to have truth, righteousness, Peace, faith, salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. Now, how complicated is that? Paul says that you have to have um, truth, righteousness, faith, salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. And I, I like all the little illustrations. And in Sunday school, they, they get the little kids and they have the armor of God costume. And that's great if you're a little kid. But if you're a mature Christian, it's not about knowing all the little pieces It's right there in Ephesians chapter 6. You have to have truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. And you have to use those things and activate those things on a daily basis. Now, I didn't know the events that were going to take place today. had no idea. I had no clue, no inkling. God didn't give me a dream. The events that took place today that I have been describing to you were known only to the Lord. But because I was prayed up and I was where God had placed me and where God had put me, I was ready when he sent me into the battle today. Will you be ready when he sends you in? Whatever that battle may be and whatever that battle may look like. 
truth, righteousness, peace, salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. This is how we do spiritual warfare. And don't allow yourself to be sidetracked. Now look, when we do our podcasts and we talk about the news of the day, and yes, we that's the time to be talking about Bill Gates and Anthony Fauci and the fourth industrial revolution and the great reset and the internet of bodies and all that other stuff and digital identification and messenger RNA and all that stuff. There is a time and place to be talking about that. But we talk about those things so we can have a proper understanding of the battle that we're in. And as you're seeing tonight, the battle that we're in is a spiritual battle. And the only way that you get prepared for that battle, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. Anything else will not do. And you cannot allow yourself to be distracted by politics and all that other garbage and all that other nonsense. We are here to be a witness and to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Um, Turn to Acts chapter 28. And I'll close with this. Turn to Acts chapter 28. This is what Paul says. Acts 28, verse 28. Be it known unto you, therefore, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words... The Jews departed, having great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Paul says three times, follow me as I follow Christ. The Apostle Paul, when he was in prison for the last couple of years of his life, he didn't waste five seconds railing against the unfair government. He didn't waste five seconds exposing Caesar. Paul spent the last years of his life preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to be followers of the Apostle Paul. We are called to do what he did. Now, we are not all planted in the same place. We are not all gifted in the same way. But we are all called to preach and teach the kingdom of God and those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the main things that the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. That concerns the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we're to preach and teach and warn every man Colossians chapter 1, verse 26, Colossians 1, 26. Even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working which worketh in me mightily. Paul says three times, Be ye followers of me. 
What did Paul do? He preached. He warned every man. He taught every man. About what? The gospel of the grace of God? About the kingdom of God? About the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what Paul was called to do, and we're called to follow him. That is what you're called to do, and that is what I am called to do. And the only way you're going to be able to do it is you've got to get into Ephesians chapter 6 and understand that the armor of God is truth, verse 14, righteousness, verse 14, Peace, verse 15, faith, verse 16, salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, verse 17, praying for the saints, that's verse 18, and then opening up your mouth boldly, that's verse 19. And that is a very practical, easy to understand, boots on the ground, Bible study of what the whole armor of God actually is and what you're supposed to be doing with it. And that battle is all day, every day, from the time you get up to the time that you go to bed and even after you fall asleep. The spiritual battle is still raging in the heavenlies. It doesn't stop just because you're sleeping. And that's why the Bible says this. One more verse and I'm done. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself that's the Holy Spirit, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This is why you've got to have the whole armor of God, because the battle continues even after you go to bed at night, and you close your eyes and you drift off to sleep. The devil doesn't sleep. The battle doesn't stop. Jesus is not sleeping. The angels are not sleeping. The battle continues. And this is why you need the whole armor of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, for all these prayers that we prayed tonight and for everybody who has these um, urgent needs, especially our friend Anetta, who is fighting for her life in a hospital bed tonight, Lord, answer all of these prayers and help all of these people that we prayed for tonight. If you don't do it, God, it won't get done. If you don't persevere and help us to break through, we cannot get through on our own. But we are wholly and completely a dependent people upon you. And we ask you, Father God, to do for ourselves that which we have no power to do. And we just put ourselves into your hands and say, thy will be done and we'll be satisfied with that. And we'll give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you for being part of the NTEB family of Bible believers across America and around the world. Please pray for my friend, Anetta. Please pray for each other and for all these prayer requests tonight. And Lord willing, we'll see you back here Friday afternoon at noon Eastern time for another Prophecy News podcast. Have a great week, everybody.
Oh, do we go? 